In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining us here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. It's a pleasure to be with you here on a nice, sunny Saturday afternoon here in the western suburbs of Chicagoland, where we are bringing you, Chris, what do you say? It's the, something like the, the best international apologetics program out of West Chicago. <laughs> Uh, and so uh, if you had a gr- if you had the opportunity um yet uh, or if you haven't had the opportunity yet I want to invite you to listen to last week's episode on the dictionary of christianity and science uh, it's a great interview between uh, two of the general editors of that volume and uh it's really a great book I think you should check out and everyone should have it on their shelf sort of the go to uh, especially if you're not a science person it's actually very helpful uh science isn't my forte but I found a number of the uh The entries there, uh, very excellent and informative, and so I want to encourage all of you to do that. Uh, On today's episode, we're going to be talking about thoughtfulness and who is more thoughtful, atheists and Christians, uh, or rather theists more broadly speaking. But before we get into that, I've just got a a couple announcements here. If you haven't yet heard, uh, Defenders Media is partnering with the Library of Historical Apologetics Uh, to bring the Deeper Roots Conference in Kalamazoo, Michigan, September 8 and 9. And that's going to be featuring um, J. Warner Wallace and Tim McGrew and a number of other speakers uh, there. And I'm really excited about that opportunity. And so if you can make it, I'd love to see you there. And hopefully, uh, I think we might be doing a little bit of live streaming while we're there as well. So if you can't make it over to Kalamazoo, hopefully we'll be able to bring a couple of those talks uh, to you. Um... Let's see, what was next? Uh, we've got a lot of drama in the news, it seems, over uh, the Republican uh, health care bill and some other matters. Uh, and so if you want to talk about those, you're welcome to give us a call, and we'll talk about those at the end of the show today. The number is 505-2STRIVE. That's 505-278-7483. And um, <clears throat> perhaps most uh, disconcerting to me uh, happens to be the Chicago Bulls, and their recent uh, trade of Jimmy Butler uh, for some prospects, I guess if you could call him that. Um, One of the fellows uh, had uh, his ACL blown out last year, and another guy, uh, point guard Dunn, he hasn't lived up to expectations. And so uh, not too excited. So uh, I am finally uh, fed up with the Chicago Bulls (laughs) after many years. And I am looking for a new basketball team. Uh, so if you have any team that you want me to support, I'd love to get your thoughts. In fact, I might even do some sort of live stream on uh, on which team I will uh, pick. Maybe some sort of process of elimination. Of course, there are a few teams right off the bat that I won't be supporting. So I just need uh, some help picking a new one. Um, all right. Uh, so I think that does it for uh, introductory things. And so now I want to... Um, I want to segue over into uh, today's show, and um, basically this is a topic that um, is something that a lot of people debate. They think, you know, well, who's smarter, uh, Christians or um, atheists? And um, really, uh, this is something that it seems that um, scientific inquiry might be able to uh, help us in exploring these matters. And so... um, Joining me uh, now here on the show is Nick Bird, who is not a first-time guest, but a second-time guest on our program. Nick's a Ph.D. candidate at Florida State University. He works in the Social and Moral Reasoning Lab and in the Philosophy Department. Nick, thanks for joining us on the show. Thanks, Kurt. Good to be here. Yeah, and let me say, too, uh, you know, it's good to have you back. And, again, I appreciate someone like yourself where you have sort of have – these cross disciplines uh, where you're uh, looking at different fields of study and incorporating what you uh, know and have learned from both of them uh, to seek out the truth. So that's, that's some good stuff um, that you're doing. Yeah. Podcast. Cool to, to, to listen to the podcast. Um, I'm going to be asking for 
listening to Paul Copen's episode of Blues Bat. Yeah. Enjoying that. Yeah, thanks, thanks. Um, okay, so <clears throat> tell us a little bit about here, about the, we're getting into your, your research um, on this, and there has been some work done, uh, some studies on the, um, um, I guess, correlation, I guess even maybe causation, um, perhaps between people's thoughtfulness and their religious or disreligious um, dispositions. Am I saying that correctly? <laughs> Yeah, that, that might be a fair, a fair way to put it. We, we, um, it's probably best to start with just the correlational stuff since that's the most, the. That's easier. Controversial stuff. Yeah, it's easier to illustrate yeah, that. Yeah, definitely <laughs> easier. Yeah. So, so there's this, this question of, uh, of whether there's differences in the way people reason. And uh, there's this other question of whether there's differences in the way that, say, theists reason as compared to atheists and or agnostics. Mm-hmm. And so that's kind of what this research is, is about. And um, there's various ways to measure how people reason. Um, and just to give you an example, I'll ask you a question. So here's a question for you. All right. A bat and a ball? A bat and a ball cost $1.10 in total. The bat costs uh, uh, $1.10. Okay, hang on. Wait, wait, wait. I need, I need pen and paper here. <laughs> All right. Uh, a bat and a ball cost how much? <laughs> a bat and a ball. A, you uh, you probably won't need a piece of paper, but I'll give you the rest of it. Okay. A bat and a ball cost dollar ten in total. The bat costs a dollar more than the ball. So how much does a ball cost? Five cents. Good. So that is the correct answer. Cool. The vast majority of people will say ten cents. Uh, I see. Uh, to this question. Because they think so they think seems- the bat's a dollar, therefore you've got ten cents left over. Um, but that wasn't your question. Your question was, if the ball, if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball, how much is the ball worth? Right. Good. Good. Yeah. So, um, like I said, the vast majority of people, atheists or not, the vast majority of people answer that question as ten cents, even though that is demonstrably incorrect. Right. Right. Uh, but you know. It's, people report this with some confidence. And then there is, there are some people who report the correct answer like you did, which is five cents. Yeah. Um, and there's a whole bunch of these types of questions that there is this, what some people call the intuitive answer yeah. mm-hmm. that is demonstrably false. Um, and so based on how people respond to this question, we can kind of get some idea about how people reason and maybe how re- people reason differently. Hmm. Um, and so it turns out that when you give these types of questions to to uh, people, theists tend to answer 10 cents. Uh, that is the intuitively in, but incorrect answer. Okay. Theists tend to give that answer more often than atheists, and atheists tend to give the 10 cent, uh, sorry, the 5 cents answer, which is the correct answer, mm. more often than theists. Um, and so the question is, like, you know, what conclusions should we draw from this type of finding? Sure, sure. And now I don't know if you've got the study or, you know, there are multiple studies I'm sure that illustrate this, uh, phenomena. Um, but how much, so like uh, part of my curiosity just gets interested. How, uh, more frequently do theists answer it incorrectly versus theists? So you said it happens more frequently. I mean, how much of a, of a rate are we talking here? Good. So the effect size is somewhere between. 0.18 0.18 and 0.25 uh, or something like that. That would be Cohen's D, but that's a technical term. So one way to put it is um, it's a roughly 18% more frequently. Um, Got it. So it's not, it's not like, uh, you know, theists get all of these questions wrong and <laughs> atheists get all of these questions right. You know, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a probability difference, it's, and it's not even that big, but it is statistically significant. Sure. Um, um, and you know, it's not, it's not entirely negligible. So, um, but that's good that you're asking that question to try and quantify the difference. Mm. Yeah. And, um, okay. So, so we've got this study here, how, um, y- you and we, in preparation for the show have used the term theism or a, a theist specifically, uh, these are people of all sorts of religious backgrounds. Um, you know, Hindus, uh, Muslims, Jew- Jews, Christians, or is it just Christians? That's a really good question. So there are a few different scales people use to to figure out like what what type of religion some people associate with. Um, in the studies, uh, 
the most common studies, it's kind of a general belief in God, and then um, maybe some questions about uh, how confident you are. So, like, there are people who call themselves like agnostic, but not atheist, mm, mm-hmm. uh, and things like that. So, it, so in general, it's just theism. It's not necessarily Christianity, uh, as opposed to Buddhism, as opposed to maybe like uh, Judaism or anything like that. It's just a general theism. Sure. And maybe where these studies uh, happen and how they happen might determine, you know, if a majority of them are, you know, Christians. You know, if the study is done, say, in the American South versus if the study is done, say, in India, that's going to give you a different sort of religious um, background for the theists that are taking these um, surveys, if you will. Yeah, so that's a really good uh, good point. So there's a few different places that this research tends to happen. Um, Gordon Pennycook is a name that's often uh, heard in, in this research, and Gordon does research both as college students and as well as just people online. And people online can be from anywhere, depending on how you right. collect yeah. your sample. Yeah. Um, and Will Gervais or Gervais um, is another person who does these studies, and he does these studies in Kentucky, um, and so that is the American South, as you mentioned, and and that actually his samples of participants do it, uh, his, the responses on, on these questions that I told you about they are markedly different than um, than other other samples of questions, mm-hmm. uh, and so so in, in in the Kentucky samples people tend to answer with the the 10th sense or the intuitively but incorrect uh, answer more sure. often than these other samples. So yeah, so that's actually a fair point and with some empirical support. Yeah, that would that would also be just another interesting um, thing to study the theists' variety of answers. Uh, you know how you know say Christians maybe answered it more intuitively, or maybe just cer- Christians in a certain region as well. Um, so that could be also be yep. other things. But I don't want to get too. Uh, too far down the rabbit trail. Um, so when we talk about sort of thoughtfulness or being reflective, how is it something that we can measure when someone is reflective? Good. So um, I'll just give you the simplest way. So I gave you that question, and there was a, an intuitive answer or what you might call an unreflective answer, and then there was this reflective answer. And so you can basically give people a series of questions and then count up how many times they answer the reflective response versus how many times they answer the unreflective response. Mm. And you can give them a score. So like if they get two out of three uh, reflective responses, then that becomes a, uh, um, you know, a number that you can plug into uh, your statistical analysis to, 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 to compare with other participants. Um, So that's kind of one way of measuring, but you know, three questions isn't, a very powerful measure. So right. there have been further uh, further ways to measure this, which involve like six or 12 or 18 or even more questions mm. of this variety to, to get a, a more robust measurement of the, of the differences in reasoning. Um, and so you'll sometimes hear the phrase uh, analytical reasoning style or, or like analytical reasoning uh, questions. And these are the types of questions that people are referring to. Uh, and and there's, a, there's a large quantity of them. And so it basically is you give people a, a bunch of questions and you figure out how many of their answers are reflective versus re- intuitive, and then that number helps uh, inform your statistical analysis. And um, are participants uh, timed based on how long it takes them to answer a question? And, and part of the reason why my asking of this is because I could imagine taking a test and um, – you know, you, ha- you sort of second guess yourself, right? <laughs> and maybe you still, after being reflective, you still put the so-called intuitive answer down. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, so um, I would imagine some people probably do measure reaction time okay. um, or answer time. Um, there's some controversy in the field about how meaningful that stuff is because some people seem to be able to get to the correct answer rather quickly. Uh-huh. Um, and so... It, do, it doesn't seem like there's kind of a one-to-one correlation between like the amount of time it takes you to answer and how reflectively you answer. Cause some people can answer very reflectively very quickly, but other people can't. Right. right. Um, and it might depend on like, you know, uh, how comfortable you are with math for instance. So, yeah, but that's, that's a good question. Okay. Um, so let's, let's discuss the details of the findings. Um, you know, how, how many, um, for instance, how many atheists typically take the test? I mean, what what are the sample sizes here of these studies? And and maybe I don't know. Can you 
are there many of these studies or are there just a few? Um, what sort of Good. efforts been put out there? Good. So there's this paper by Penny Cook and colleagues. It's called Atheists and Agnostics Are More Reflective Than Religious Believers. Um, and this paper has four studies of its own. Okay. And then it analyzes another 30, 30 or so studies. So like, that's at least 35 right there. Yeah. And it's a total, when you add up all the participants, it's a total of over 15,000 participants. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know, it's a pretty big sample size. Um, And on average, these studies are like, you know, a a few hundred people or something like that. Um, And so even those, even those individual studies are pretty large. Uh, So the sample sizes are pretty good uh, at the individual level. And they're, they're very good at the meta analysis level, like this paper that I mentioned. Okay. What is, um, help us out. What is, um, what is a meta analysis? Good question. So in um, psychology, there's what's called a study, and that's where you like, you know, you take, say, 200 people, and then you ask them some questions, and you collect some other data about them. That's a study. And then when you have a bunch of studies, say like 10, you can take all the data from all of those studies Mm. and then run analysis on all 10 of them at the same time Mm. to see if there's any, like, differences in the patterns over multiple studies. That's a meta-analysis. Right. Okay. So meta-analysis is basically analyzing multiple studies. Right, right. Okay. Cool, cool. All right, so um so that's really neat that they can look at um basically all of the studies uh on record or that have been published and then to provide an analysis of the the findings there. Um cool. And so we see then this general trend. Uh I'm sure in some studies, you know, the studies vary from the findings. Um but the general trend is that um Atheists have what you've said here is 18 to 25 percent more probability of of being uh, reflective or thoughtful um, to these questions than theists. Is that right? Yeah, that's 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 the general finding. Gotcha. Now that's you know before we continue. So that's not to say that um, there aren't smart theists, right? This is just a general trend. Of course not, right? Yeah, yeah. Just I want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That would that would that would definitely be something you do not want to take away from these findings, right? Because I mean, there's obviously the uh, the Alvin Plantingas and the Richard Swinburns and uh, Paul Copens and you know many 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 other scholars. You know, even in history like Elizabeth Anscombe and stuff. So yeah, uh, there have been very very many smart people. Right, right, and um, and we could also you know just to look at the other side of the coin, we also might perhaps know atheists that aren't very uh, reflective. So you can sort of get, um, you know, both sides of the spectrum there. That's totally, I don't want to name names, but yeah, definitely. (laughs) 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 Well, sometimes even those, the popular atheists like Richard Dawkins, and again, I don't know where you stand personally on this, but sometimes, you know, Richard Dawkins, he might, he's a brilliant scientist, don't get me wrong, but I find some of his philosophical statements m- might be uh, subpar, um, and of course L- Lawrence Krauss. Many philosophers would agree. Yes, yes, and, and you know Lawrence Krauss's um, use of the word "nothing" is is often a miscommunication with philosophers when philosophers use the word "nothing" when Krauss talks about a universe from nothing. Um, so yeah, so there are um, there are um, maybe could we call them outliers or is it uh, is it more common? Um, than than merely outliers. So let's say, you know, are smart theists outliers from the trend? Is that accurate or not quite? Smart theists. You know, that's a good question. So I, I think this might depend on the like the culture of society you're you're asking this to. So in the U.S., for instance, where most of this research is done, mm-hmm. um, you know, Christianity is is kind of maybe the mainstream religion of the religious options. Mm-hmm. So like main, uh, Christianity, one way to say it is Christianity is like the most common version of theism in the U.S. Yeah, sure. Um, and if that's kind of like this, if that's kind of like the background or the tradition, traditional assumption, then you might just think like it is the less reflective response in a sense. And all I mean by that is that like uh, it's people's default or something like that. Yeah. Um, and so you might wonder if you, if you went to a different place where say atheism was more prominent uh, and maybe, therefore, like the more default assumption, if mm. somehow the, the finding would switch, right? Like maybe right, right. where atheism is more prominent, um, 
atheism would turn out to be associated with less resulting reasoning somehow. Um, right. This is all speculative. Uh, that's interesting. But, but there's a thought there that's worth testing. Yeah, right. So, so basically... Um, what you're saying is in a scenario like that, where say the society is, you know, 80 to 90% um, atheist, that the findings might be switched where the theists happen to be the more reflective type. Um, and, but, but that would be interesting because then it's not necessarily something about theism or atheism, the worldviews themselves, which would uh, have people be more reflective. Is that right? Yeah, so that's a good way to think of it. So, like, we just kind of created a hypothesis about how it's not, it's not, not it's nothing about the views themselves that has to do with being reflective or unreflective. It's some, some background uh, feature of the society. So, that's like one hypothesis about what's going on here. Gotcha. Um, you might think there's a different hypothesis, though. Uh, um, there are like a few hypotheses we could explore. I don't know if those are interesting. But. Yeah, well, it seems like there are a lot of related uh, ideas here to to these findings. Um, and we certainly do want to be careful about, you know, the conclusions we might draw, you know, like how we've talked about, well, there can be smart theists, there can be reflective theists and um, intuitive atheists or non, non-reflective, non uh, not as thoughtful atheists. Um, so that's certainly something to continue the, the research uh, upon. Um, so so getting back to the, the study or studies here, um, what does this tell us? about theists or atheists um does is it able to tell us much of anything (laughs) so this is where i think it's it's worth maybe considering some some other hypotheses so we consider the hypothesis where there's like nothing about theism or atheism intrinsically uh that that's that makes it more reflective or less reflective um so another hypothesis no 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 is this it's like uh, the hypothesis would be like no there is something about theism um, that's maybe less reflective, or the other way to put it is there is something about atheism that's more reflective, and that story might go something like this. Look, uh, atheists and agnostics are just more skeptical, mm. um, and they're even more skeptical about their own judgments, and so when they're answering these questions about bats and balls, they're a little bit less confident in their own response, so they're more likely to, say, double-check their work, and mm. then realize that they made an error, and then therefore answer correctly. Um, and so you might think there's something like that going on. Again, that's a testable hypothesis. It's, it's speculative. We, there's not um, a ton of evidence that answers the question of whether that's what's really going on. But yeah. the idea is maybe that there's just a difference in skepticism here. And that sounds like totally plausible. Um, well, so sure. That would be something worth exploring in the research. Yeah, and I would think, so even if it were illustrated that atheists are, in general more skeptical or even more thoughtful, that of course doesn't lead anything about necessity, that atheists are always necessarily more thoughtful, because there are of course, you know, more thoughtful and even skeptical theists. Uh, But we just so happen to, you know, if if there was a a study that, you know, showed more of the particular here, um, it just so happened that atheists as a group were more reflective. I, I mean, I don't even think I would have so much beef with that because it doesn't say much of anything to the worldviews themselves, but I think more just about the, the people. Um, is that a fair statement? That's a good, yeah, that's a, that's a good distinction, right? You want to distinguish between the view and the people who hold the view, right? And yeah. It's not clear that if the, fi- if the finding tells us something about one, like the view, it doesn't necessarily tell us uh, something about the other, namely the person, or vice versa. If it tells us something about the person, it might not necessarily tell us anything about the view that the person holds. Yeah, right, right. So, you know, whether uh, we are in the current scenario where most of the studies are done in the States, or uh, if these studies are done in our hypothetical uh, society, um, you know, the, the the level of skepticism from the people group, right, whether the people group that's more thoughtful are atheists or if they are theists it doesn't say much of anything as to whether atheism or theism is true um and that's something that we just sort of have to continue to investigate ourselves (laughs) right yeah it's it's not clear to me it's at least it's not obvious to me how one would go about testing empirically whether theism is true or false um 
so yeah, so it's, it, it, it'd be important to, to say that this doesn't bear on that question probably. Right, 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 right. That is interesting though that <clears throat> we might find more skeptical people that are uh, atheists, at least in America, uh, based on these studies. Right. Um, because at least as far as I know, I mean, I... I, I deal with a lot of thoughtful theists <laughs> just in my field of work. Indeed. <laughs> so, but it's true. I mean, in terms of trends and just, you know, basically anybody. Um, so, oh, so that's a question. So basically, is this all on self-identification? Just anybody that considers themselves a theist, they qualify as being a theist? Um, good question. It, in a sense, yes. So there are some studies that employ very simple uh, questions about this, like, uh, do you believe in God, yes or no, or something. But most of the studies, like the vast majority of the studies, are using multi-question um, surveys yeah. about religion to determine one's quote-unquote religiosity, and as, as well as, like, the degree to which they are confident about, you know, the existence of God or okay. something like that. And that's how we can distinguish between agnosticism versus atheists. Uh, theists. Right, because you might have sort of doubtful theists, right? You might, um, and those right, those right. might be people that you want to weed out. Um, just people that they think there's a god, but they're maybe not really sure. Those sorts of things. So, in these studies, right. then, do they sort of push to the uh, opposite sides of the spectrum? Do we get the confident atheists and the confident theists, or are we really kind of looking at everyone here? Yeah, that's a good question. So in the paper that I mentioned, this this it includes four studies plus a meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. um, that paper actually has a graph in it that I think might be answering the question you're asking. And the graph basically shows a pretty clean trend line from, you know, confident theism uh, to less confident theism or like less religiously affiliated forms of theism. Like maybe you say you believe something, but you don't really participate in, it, in church at all. So you consider yourself like rel religiously unaffiliated, even though you might believe in God. Yeah. Um, so there's strong theism and then there's this, this like less confident version and then there's agnosticism and then obviously there's atheism. And there seems to be a trend from less reflective to more reflective. And it's a kind of pretty clean trend in this graph and that paper. Um, and this paper is really available to anyone if you know if a listener is interested um, in it. So, um, yeah, I think there might be a pretty clear trend from one to the other in terms of like confidence in God's existence, mm. from very confident to to uh, confident against God's existence. Right. But now, even still, um, I might think that confidence isn't necessarily an indicator of necessarily an indicator of reflectfulness either, right? Oh, right. And that's why we would measure reflectiveness in, uh, independently with these measures, like the questions that I've been asking. It's just that confidence correlates with yeah. measures of reflection. So, yeah. Right, because, I, I mean, I know plenty of people that are confident about things, but they're <laughs> they can be wrong, totally wrong. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. So confidence is not a normative uh, uh, property necessarily. It might just be, uh, you know, uh, just, just, just we're just describing someone's confidence. We're not saying whether or not they should be confident. Right. So we might have a scenario here where there might be, say, not so confident atheists and even not so confident theists who all happen to be very reflective. That's true. So there's definitely going to be a class of people that are that way. Um, the data suggests, though, that those would be, they wouldn't be the most reflective people on average. On average. Okay. Because I know, you know, even some theists that are very re reflectful, but, you know, their confidence level might not be through the roof. Uh, you know, how do we judge confidence, you know, 100% confidence, uh, sort of tautological uh or say 80% confidence. I'd have to look into the studies to see sort of what level of confidence would qualify people to fit with those camps. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think what you're saying makes sense. I think like if you were to imagine drawing a trend line from like, you know, less reflective to more reflective, there's just going to be tons of people very close to that trend line. Mm -hmm. 
And that's kind of, that represents, so to speak, the average. But like you mentioned, there's going to be these outliers, right? So there's going to be dots uh, that represent people that are way more reflective than average. And maybe there's going to be dots that are way less than average, uh, way less reflective than average. Um, and so at every stage, whether it's theism or agnosticism or atheism, there's going to be people that are very far from this average line. But most of the people will be uh, close to this average trend line. Mm. That's kind of the, the picture. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, uh, well, Nick, we've got to take a break here. Um, but when we come back uh, from the break, we've got some other things to talk to, talk to you about. I've got more questions for you regarding uh, the, the studies here. So uh, stick with us through this short break from our sponsors. Thanks. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Hello, I'm David Smith, the Executive Director of Illinois Family Institute, a state-based Christian pro-life and pro-family public policy organization. I want to invite you to join us as we seek to be salt and light to a dark and rapidly decaying culture. You can do that in a number of ways. For example, you can join our email list to get timely alerts and great cultural commentaries. You can like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, listen to our podcasts, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can attend one or more of the special events and forums we host in different parts of the state. We do all these things to encourage and equip Christians in Illinois. You see, we need you to help us fulfill our mission to boldly bring a biblical perspective to public policy. Our faith requires us to be bold, speak truthfully, and love our neighbors. Join us. Visit IllinoisFamily.org to learn more. Are you tired of wasting your time and money on ads that just aren't producing? What if there was an easier way to get great advertising results with tons of traffic and social engagement to your brand without wasting your time or money? Well, there is an easier way, and it's called TrafficBuffet.com a new and easy way to generate the traffic you need through our global network of publishers, all with one click. Explode your site traffic and send tens of thousands of potential customers to your site daily. Build your brand with our social campaigns like Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and more. Our dedicated account reps provide amazing support. So don't wait. Get started today. TrafficBuffet.com. Measurable results, driving success. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. All right. Thanks for uh, sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. I'm here with Nick Bird, and today we're discussing uh, thoughtfulness. Who's more thoughtful, atheists or theists? And uh, before we get into that, I do have a giveaway um, here, and for those especially following the live stream. Uh, You can uh, see here this book. It is Good Faith, Being a Christian When Society Thinks You're Irrelevant and Extreme by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons. And it's even signed by the authors. Uh, Compliments here of Baker Books. Uh, So if you want to win this book, all you have to do is this. Get ready. Here it is. Just share the live stream video. All you got to do is click share. Share it with your friends. And uh, you'll be entered here to win uh, this book here. So uh, I'd love for you to participate with that. If you don't have Facebook uh, then, ooh, what do we do for people like that, Chris? Um, how about join the texting list? Hey, you can join the texting list behind you by typing veracity to <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so if you want to join the texting plan, totally free, and I don't bombard people at all. In fact, I don't think I've used it in a couple weeks in terms of sending out one. Uh, but every now and again, I'll shoot you a text. Just text the word veracity. That's V-E-R-A-C-I-T-Y to the number 555 uh, so if you don't want to share uh, the the live stream here, you can do that and you'll be entered. So any people that do that have a chance to win that book. Maybe they could. Maybe they could also text you the word book. 
or oh, something. Text the word book. Yeah, text the word. Text the word book. Well, that would only work if they're already uh, subscribed to the uh, yes. to the list. So they should get subscribed to the list, and then text and then the word ten, text the word book. That would work as well. Yeah, yeah I'll but, keep my eye out for that. Yeah. All right, so we're talking about thoughtfulness here. Uh, there have been a number of studies, just about 35 studies here, uh, with over uh, or roughly about 15,000 participants. And the trend has discovered that atheists in general um, tend to be more reflective and thoughtful uh, toward answering a number of questions, um, maybe even some mathematical um, but Nick, you said maybe th there were some other types of questions that weren't necessarily mathematical. Is that right? Yes, yeah, so there's some logic questions as well. Um, uh, so it just gives you like a few premises and asks if the conclusion is true. And oh. you have to say whether it is or not. I love this stuff. Like Give me the test. <laughs> yeah, you might. <laughs> maybe I'll send, you, I'll send you what I've got. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be really funny. Maybe I'll post my results up on the the website. Um, and I know Nick, you mentioned. Well, you're one for you're one for one right now. Nice. So you're doing really well. Good, uh, Nick. You mentioned that um, that article <clears throat> um, by uh, Penny Cook and um, and others. I guess um, we're gonna get that up on the guess. Uh, it might be uh, some some other type of thing going on, but it's just a difference in reasoning between two different groups that we don't need to uh, take too much. Um, stock into in, in terms of like the, the, the beliefs or features of these people. And do um, <clears throat> do sort of some of the preliminary questions to help sort of weed out um, uh, persons, do they consider like educational background, you know, whether people have a high school uh, diploma, college experience, college degree, graduate level? That's a really good question. A very, uh, you'd be a good experimentalist. So, yeah. So when people run these studies, they're um, they're also measuring things like um, how good are you at math, how comfortable are you with math, what level of education do you have, what's uh, things like this. And it turns out that the the being ref more or less reflective is is not. Um, it doesn't just reduce to how good you are at math or what your level of education is. There's it's um, it's independent of these things to some extent, and even. Um, the way in which reflectiveness relates to theism and atheism, even that is independent from uh, uh, education and, and then one's uh, mathematical competence or what people call numerosity. Mm -hmm. Interesting. <clears throat> yeah, that would be... Uh, it, it seems like there's really just a lot of uh, further uh, research that, that needs to be done. So how could further studies help to answer some of these uh, yet unanswered questions. Good. So I think there's some studies that have art that are already being done, and then maybe we could I could toss out a couple ideas for things that could be done if they haven't already been done. So you guys uh, were quick to pick up on just some questions about the cognitive reflection questions themselves, and so I think in general we should study what's going on when people answer these questions. Mm -hmm. Um. So you might think, uh, you know, that what's going on when I ask you the question about the bat and the ball is um, some people first think the incorrect answer, and then some other people, after thinking that incorrect answer, realize their error and then correct their error. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's people like Kurt Jaros who just <laughs> get the answer right off the bat. Um, and so that's an, in that's an interesting difference that we should want to study and try to figure out what's going on there and if yeah. that's meaningful. <clears throat> Yeah, that that would be interesting. Or, or as I previously mentioned, the the second guessers. So maybe, maybe they're like they've got the intuitive, the so-called intuitive response, and then they think about it. They think maybe they're wrong, and then they think, no, no, I'm going to go with the intuitive one. <laughs> so, the second right, or right. third guessers. That would be interesting. Types. We could of, call them the the double downers or something like that. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, nice. I like it. A gambling reference, right? Isn't that a gambling reference? Doubling down. I think it is. Yeah, maybe poker? Blackjack, maybe? I think blackjack. Nice. Okay. <laughs> That's great. Well, use that in your research when you uh, <clears throat> publish more on this. Talk about the, the double downers. Yeah, I'll say, I'll say, I'll say you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, even though I'm I'm a PhD student myself studying theology, my, may, maybe you'll you'll beat me in the first time I'll be referenced in a published journalist for that. <laughs> Hilarious. Hey, you never know. That's right. That's right. Nice. Um okay, so what other sorts of things 
uh, can we try to explore for for this area? Yeah. So here's a, here's here's a really important one that I think um, could be overlooked if if uh, if especially if you're let's say you're an atheist and you look at studies like this and you kind of kind of walk away from the study kind of self congratulating right. uh, sure. in a self congratulatory way, saying like, oh yeah, look, I'm I'm so much smarter than these theists. Well, here's one um, worry about these studies, and this is based on evidence that we already have. Okay. From, um, Dan Kahan. And, and the worry is this. There's evidence that suggests that like the better you are at math and the better you are at some types of reasoning, the more polarized you are uh, mm. in, your, in certain beliefs. So it seems like there's, there's, a, there's a degree to which people who are better at reasoning don't necessarily use their better reasoning for good, right? Mm. Uh, they might use it to come to more extreme am- uh, uh, views, or they might use it to try to argue their way out of like counter evidence or something like this. Okay. And so we might think, look, being, re- being reflective, it might be good, but it's not necessarily good, right? You can use your reflective capacities to argue for uh, conclusions that maybe aren't uh, good conclusions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. Um, you know, another thing I was thinking about there while we were, um, talking about sort of the smarter that people are, um, the more polarizing, uh, they become. Uh, I, I think, you know, I've seen a various number of articles, you know, shared online about, um, scientists, sort of like the smartest scientists and like a majority of them happen to be Christians, uh, or, or maybe theists in general. And so I think that's, um, an interesting thing that some people might think about here, um, as they might tend to think, especially in a, in our society where, sort of uh, scientism, this idea that science is the only way to truth. Um, uh, they might tend to think that, oh, well, scientists are the smartest people. Um, but as you mentioned, there are other ways people can be smart uh, as well. And even if they are smart, that doesn't necessarily lead again to one's position on uh, the isms, if you will. So... Yeah, that's that's a that's a good point. Uh, this is certainly something that would be relevant to science. Yep, yep. Um, okay, so tell me, I, I want to get a bit more um, personal here regarding your research. So, what are the sort of things you're doing, um, if I can ask you, <laughs> in in this area? What sort sure. of what sort of questions are you trying to answer uh, from studying this? Yeah, so I'm interested in how people reason, which is probably obvious by now. I'm also interested in the differences between the way people reason, mm-hmm. probably, probably also obvious. But I'm interested in the particular about, say, the way that philosophers and scientists reason, uh, yeah. sort of going back to what you just said. But um, in my past research, I found that um, some of the differences that we find among the general public, like the reasons uh, the stuff we've been talking about here, like differences in reflection, correlate differences in views about God, mm. We also find this among people in academia. So even among people who have PhDs in philosophy, there seems to be the same difference. So the people who have PhDs in philosophy, the ones who are theists, tend to answer more unreflectively on these types of questions than the PhDs in philosophy who are atheists, right? So so that's maybe another sign that, like, there really is something going on here. Yeah. Um, Right, because you're... uh, if I may interrupt, sorry, um, you're, you're dealing, when you do a study it like that, you're dealing with some smart people, people that have PhDs and in philosophy, um, you know, these aren't just your, your uneducated, you know, person, your, um, you know, your blue, uh, blue class worker. Um, that's, that is interesting that the results would be, um, similar. I'd be interested to know what sort of probability. Maybe the probability lowers, though? It is slightly smaller. So I think the effect size, uh, so I think the last time I mentioned the effect size, it was from 0.18 to 0.25, mm-hmm. or 18 to 25%. I think the effect size we're looking at is smaller than that in uh, among the PhDs in philosophy. It's yeah. still statistically significant, but I think, like you're pointing out, it, um, it is smaller. Yeah. Boy, that's... So. Yeah. So, so there's... That's surprising to me, but <laughs> it was surprising to me as well, to be honest. Uh, and I think it was surprising to my supervisors who thought that, that, you know, they had this general thought like, look, of course you can 
find that undergraduates answer questions strangely and have yeah. strange views, but you're not going to find that among people who've been studying philosophy for X amount of years. And then it turns out, well, uh, you know, maybe you actually do find some, uh, some of the same differences huh. among philosophers. So, so, uh, um, so yeah, continue on. What, what, what else are you, um, uh, what other sorts of questions are you seeking to answer? So related to these questions, it's just the idea of like, hey, if, if there's differences in reflection based on, um, you know, what your views about God are, are there differences in reflection on your other views, like maybe things that don't even have to do with religion? Mm. And it turns out there are. So there's a lot of studies showing that like differences in reflection are related to how you think about moral problems. Or like moral like problems. whether the Chicago Bulls are a team that uh, people should support because... Uh, Gar Foreman and John uh, Paxson have no idea what they're doing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is really important moral uh, moral stuff here, right? So it, we would definitely need to get to the bottom of where do the reflective people lie on this Chicago Bulls issue? <laughs> yeah, when... when... Uh, but, you know, no, seriously. <laughs> um, uh, so, like, take a moral dilemma. Uh, so some people might be familiar with what's called the trolley problem. And in the trolley problem... Oh, yes, I remember those trolley, trolley problems. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, you, uh, the idea is there's a trolley going down the track, and um, someone's it's, laying it's down. A, you can a, flip a the switch. Of, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, and if if you flip the switch, it will instead of uh, killing five people on the track, it'll kill just one person. And so the question is, like, do you pull the switch to to save the five people and then kill the one person? And it turns out, like, how reflective you are correlates with how you answer this question. Mm. Um, and and so the general finding is that the more reflective you are, the more likely you are to answer utilitarianly, which is to say, the more likely you are to pull the switch to save five and kill one. Mm. And I would want to, I would want to ask. Some, well, we don't have to get ahead. into the trolley. <laughs> I mean, I would want to say, well, why yeah, are yeah, the yeah. five people there in the first place? You know, were they? Did someone tie them down and all that? You know. But I know, I know that the trolley problems have a history of of debate and even if people are on social media and if you're a facebook friend with you know someone who studied philosophy these things get shared i mean i've seen so many different things and you know people then put you know contemporary issues you know i saw one i saw one recently nick uh, a trolley problem where um the trolley problem went down to to friday and then it went off into Saturday, and if you flip the switch, you know, Rebecca Black would start singing or something like that. You know, it's Friday, Friday. Oh, no. <laughs> so there's definitely... Anything but that. <laughs> so obviously people have taken the trolley problems and run with them. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of cool to know that philosophy has, like, a meme. It's, it's gone viral. And oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, I'll have to maybe share some online. I'll find them, but definitely, I especially have one buddy who shares a lot of them. So I see um, I see the trolley problems, uh, trolley problem memes pop up every once in a while. That is that is funny. So okay, getting back to the serious stuff though. Uh, <clears throat> but so you find here that you know with with moral reasoning um, that people tend to answer utilitarian. Uh, you said, and now while I'm familiar with that term, tell me, you know, what is utilitarianism? What what does that mean to answer the question in a utilitarian way? And is that just where you save more people than the one in the trolley problem? And what makes that u utilitarian? Good. These are these are really good questions. So, um, in general, you might say that utilitarians believe that something like the consequences are what justify uh, an action. That is, the consequences are what we should consider when we're considering something, whether it's something is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you're faced with a trolley problem, and you want to ask about the consequences. And the consequences in the trolley problem are one person dies or five people die. Mm. And so on this analysis, it seems... You know, it might seem obvious that like, well, you know, one killing only one is better than killing five. So I should do whatever I need to do to kill only one instead of killing five. So that's kind of what makes that response utilitarian. But um, um, but even still, for yeah. for the utilitarian response, it seems like there are still intuitive ideas. So, for instance, uh, utilitarians might ask uh, or, or seek to do sort of the greatest good right for the most amount of people. But 
there's still an intuitive question. Well, what is good? What is a good thing? Uh, what is responsibility? Good. Um, you know, it, it, <laughs> if the five people are tied to the track and you didn't tie them down, are you responsible and to what degree uh, if you then allow them to die versus, say, cognitively choosing to kill an innocent person? So the, it seems like there are still intuitive questions uh, relevant to these moral reasoning problems. Yeah, this is really good. And I think this what you're saying reveals um, a way in which the word intuition is being used in two different senses. So, okay. Um, some people, um, some people have talked about, uh, the word intuitive as opposed to reflective. So it's like, it's, it's supposed to be, it's the contrast between reflective and intuitive. Um, but then there's this other sense of intuition. And the idea is just that we have, uh, strong, uh, salient judgments about certain cases, like, uh, you know, like, like moral cases, like for instance, we have the intuition that it's wrong to torture babies mm -hmm. and there's nothing that's necessarily reflective or unreflective about that. The idea is just that we just have this strong feeling that something is either right or wrong, even though necess we don't necessarily like have an argument that that's the case. We just feel rather strongly about it. Right. So that's one type of intuition. But the other type of intuition that we've been talking about here is just sort of like a lack of attention to your own reasoning. So it's not necessarily that you have a strong feeling and that you don't have an argument for the strong feeling. It's just that you haven't thought explicitly through every step in your reasoning process. That's mm -hmm. all that's meant by intuitive in this other sense. And when we pull those two apart, I think that um, we, can, we, can, we can kind of draw the principal differences between the way intuitive is being used in the trolley problem. So we have this intuition about certain ethical things mm -hmm. um, on the one hand, and then we have this uh, unreflective thought um, perhaps about the trolley problem. And, and this unreflective thought is not the same thing as our, our intuitions. Right, right. So maybe, so forgive me for miscommunicating. So I think, um, yes, it's, it's... No, you're actually using the word that, you're using the word the way many people in the literature do use the word. I'm okay. actually making a, maybe a criticism of the way it's used in literature. So you're, gotcha. you're fine. Okay, all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. Um, so, right. So it seems that, like I said, maybe there are still issues to explore um you know on this and and to say you know one side is utilitarian i mean i just have questions more about what all of that entails so that's that's all very interesting okay and that but oh go ahead go ahead i don't know go ahead oh well i was going to ask you um if there were any other final sort of unanswered questions that that you're seeking to uh, explore Good. So there is this, this one finding that I, I selfishly want to mention, and the finding is the following. In multiple papers, it's been shown, uh, and these are very large sample sizes. So one sample size was about 500, and another sample size was like 4,000, I think. Oh, wow. Um, 4,000 people. Um, it's been shown that the more training you have in philosophy, the more reflective you are. Mm. And so um, this is a correlation, right? So we don't necessarily want to draw the causal conclusions like uh, philosophy causes me to be more reflective or anything like that. Yeah. Uh, it's just a correlation. Um, but it's an interesting correlation, right? Um, and it sounds, you know, in a way, maybe unsurprising. But the idea here is that, like, maybe there's something about philosophy that either draws reflective people or maybe there is a cause story about uh, how philosophy does make people more reflective. We would want to test that, but um, there's at least a correlation there. Right, right. And, um, you know, of course, when you uh, surveyed the PhDs in philosophy, though, at least from what you previously mentioned, you still see sort of those traditional results, albeit to a smaller degree. Um, so that's that's something to, to consider, too. But, yeah, well, <clears throat> I know. Someone like yourself and myself, we both studied philosophy, so we we are interested to explore these sorts of questions. And um, you know, it's it's something not a lot of people um, do, and that's part of the the goal of our show here is to get people thinking about you know things in a in a meaningful way, uh, and to even to learn how to think well about things. So you know, Nick, you, you and I have pointed out here the difference between correlation and causation. That's something that, um, especially for, for someone like yourself, you probably come, that, that seems to be one of the criticisms a lot in, in psychological studies, uh, the correlation causation distinction, am I right? Indeed. And to be honest, I find myself 
falling for it sometimes. I, uh, I tend to assume a causal interpretation of correlations, and I have to check myself. Yeah. So, you know, it's a very common um, intuition to have. Right, yeah, I was just going to say it's an intuition that we <laughs> we often have. Yeah. And maybe that's because we're looking to quickly confirm our own beliefs. You know, we think, oh, yeah, well, of course that's the case. You know, of course there's a ca- causal relationship. Um but it can, it can be, as we've talked about, it's a lot harder. It's easier to prove a correlation, uh, but it's harder to prove that there is a causal relationship between uh, two things. So, Indeed. Well, Nick, um, what are some of the ways that people can uh, find out about this research? And I can post stuff on Veracity Hill in as much as you'll tell me what to post. So tell me. Good. Well, I have, I've got a, a short list for you. So if people really like books, um, especially like kind of books for the general public, there's this really great book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay. And that's by Daniel Kahneman. Um, and that's just like one of the best and most famous books on the, these questions. Um, so Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, great place to start. Okay. There's also a couple of researchers that I mentioned. So Gordon Pennycook is, is a name that, to look up. Mm-hmm. Gordon Pennycook's supervisor, by the way, was Valerie Thompson, Valerie Thompson's a very good uh, researcher in this area. Mm. Um, and then there's some other names that I mentioned. One of them is Will Gervais. Okay. And I think he's in Kentucky. Uh, he does research on this stuff. Um, one more name is Ara Norenzian. And Ara is A-R-A. And Norenzian is N-O-R-E-N-Z-A-Y-A-N. Okay. He does lots of interesting research on this stuff. And I guess, you know, maybe selfishly, I'll just say, I have a blog and I talk about my research. <laughs> so if you want to go to my website, you can, ch- you can check that out. You know, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and you can, yeah. I post about this stuff all, all the time there. And I'm willing to, you know, chat and, and, and engage with this stuff on social media as well. Nice, nice. Now, when are you looking to finish your, uh, your PhD? So I've got two years of funding left and I better be done by then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I hear you. I've got, uh, I think about a year and a half left myself and <laughs> that's right. It's okay. the better be done. <laughs> Indeed. We're starting to feel that pressure. Oh yes. Yes. I, uh, I just commented to a buddy, um, that, uh, I, I sort of felt like a cloud, uh, over my head. Um, before I let you go here, um, We've got uh, a commenter online here. His name's Jonathan, um, and he writes, uh, interesting about the effect size decreasing for philosophers, and he writes, Justin and I, maybe, maybe this is someone you know, he writes, Justin and I looked at some of our backlog data and found that the effect size actually went up um, for philosophers. He writes, our estimate for the Spearman uh, correlation between CRT. This is certainly someone that's in your field. <laughs> correlation between CRT three yeah. and uh, um, religiosity was around um, negative point uh, three seven, so thirty seven percent of restricting attention to people oh, with a philosophy. Huh? Um, so this uh, he writes. This was actually Did you say the name was Jonathan. Yeah, Jonathan. Uh, I, I typically don't say last names. Live but, and good. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> <laughs> well, only because oh, you guessed if I it. I just revealed him. Well, he has he does great work on this, so I'll I'll plug his name nice. in a positive way. Yeah, well, he commented here on our on, stuff. on our feed. So, thanks for your uh, comment there, Jonathan. We appreciate it, and uh, that is that is interesting here. Um, that um, that maybe it's gone up. So this is all to say it seems like there's uh, further work uh, needing to be done. So I want to encourage you guys to continue doing that uh, and to. Um, to parse out these fine distinctions that that need to be parsed out. So, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, uh, you know, it's always a pleasure chatting with you, and we'll have to bring you on again sometime soon. Likewise. Maybe we can talk about your dissertation. I'd love to hear about it. Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks, Kurt. You got it. We'll be in touch. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. All right, um, so I hope that this has been a, uh, a topic that's been uh, interesting to you. And uh, if you've got any questions, um, there are a number of ways you can get in touch with me or with Nick as well. Um, just go to his website at uh, birdnick.com. That's B-Y-R-D-N-I-C-K.com. Uh, one last thing. Let me say this. <clears throat> In two weeks' time, It is our one-year anniversary. It will be episode 52. Uh, We've been coming to you week after week. And so uh, for that show, I'm going to do an Ask Me Anything. 
Uh, I guess they, those often happen on Reddit. Um, but you can ask me anything. So I'm uh, now a couple weeks ahead of time soliciting your questions. I uh, would love to have anything that you um, are curious about. I'd be happy to talk about. Uh, so go ahead and submit those my way. You can email me, Kurt at VeracityHill.com. Or you can leave us a message. The number is 505-2-STRIVE. That's 505-278-7483. So that does it for the show today. I'm uh, grateful for the continued support of our patrons. Our patrons are people that just chip in a couple bucks a month to help the program run. I'd love uh, for you to to uh, give us your support. You know, five, ten dollars a month. You can do that. Just go to veracityhill.com slash patron. If at this present time, however, you're not able to to help us out, let me let me ask you this. Maybe you can go write us a review on uh, iTunes or the Google Play Store for the the podcast. Um, just tell people what you think and and share about it on social media. Uh, you can also follow us there, Veracity Hill on Twitter and uh, on Facebook as well, and share about what we're doing here. Uh, just a good opportunity to spread the word about how we're. Uh, thinking uh, on various topics and issues pertaining to one's worldview. I'm also uh, grateful for the partnerships that we have with our sponsors, Defenders Media, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, Evolution 2.0, and Ratio Christi. And I want to thank uh, Chris today for manning the technology uh, week after week. And I also want to uh, thank our guest uh, Nick Bird for coming on and talking about the uh, the research that he's been uh, undergoing and, and studying. And finally, I want to most of all thank you uh, for your commitment to listening to the show, whether you follow us live on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Central Time on our website, on uh, the Spreaker.com uh, website, uh, which is where the, the feed goes through, uh, or if you're following us on social media as well. We uh, also want to thank you if there were any technical difficulties with the live stream. Uh, thanks for sticking with us as we continue to learn more about how we can do our job better and serve you in that way. So I want to thank you, the listener, uh, for striving with me on truth, faith, uh, faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.